I'm going to focus on World Communion Sunday. So I wanted to sit at the table um, where we've been just hearing our story of our readers talking about the perhaps being at the church in Philippi um, and sharing Paul's letter, which they most likely would have shared at a table, having a meal. Um, just as we shared a, a meal today at this table, even though we didn't come and sit at it, uh, we came forward and shared at this table. World Communion, uh, which is today, used to be known as Worldwide Communion Sunday, which is the name that I grew up hearing. Um, and I'd like to, to share a couple stories about communion with you today. It's a name that not a lot of people know. You're not gonna get any greeting cards today um, celebrating Worldwide Communion Sunday. Um, many of your, your neighbors who may go to church today may not even hear that, that name being spoken at their own church. Um, it's a name that unfortunately many within the church don't know much about and depending on the church's denomination may not even celebrate it at all which for me is very sad but it's a tradition i've grown up with all my life as i said worldwide communion sunday which is what it was known was a gift of the presbyterian church it was first celebrated back in 1933 um, in shadyside presbyterian church in pittsburgh pennsylvania and it was their attempt back in the 30s to try to bring together the churches and their community um, around a, a common theme and a common sense of unity that as brothers and sisters in Christ, they were sharing the same bread and the same cup together. And that sense of unity uh, was important for this church at that time. Now, the, the concept started very slow. Um, it didn't take real hold much in the Presbyterian church for quite a while. Um, but during the Second World War, a spirit caught hold, in part because not only were churches, but um, the world was trying to grasp with a sense of, of purpose and unity um, and a spirit. And World Communion Sunday was a way to symbolize that even though we had differences in, in language and practice, there was something so basic that unified us. And it was the gifts of the Lord at the Last Supper. It was a spiritual bonding and it emphasized that we are one in the spirit and one in the gospel of Christ. So the celebration of worldwide communion was adopted by the Presbyterian Church um, sometime by 1938, 39, and in 1940, an organization that would later become the National Council of Churches adopted it as a practice, encouraging all denominations to celebrate it. Today, World Communion Sunday is celebrated in Christian churches around the world, um, demonstrating that the church that was founded on Jesus Christ peacefully shares God's giving gifts in a world that's continually divided. Now, growing up for me, this was always a Sunday that we had different types of bread, kind of like we imagine are still here on this table but are now downstairs ready for you. But we always had different types of breads um, we would often use different languages and sing songs of church unity to be reminded that while we're worshiping here at St. John's, there are Christians around the world who are also celebrating communion this morning, sharing the bread and the fruit of the cup. And as we do so, while we worship in different ways with different music in different buildings, um, there's something basic that unites us together and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered us this meal that we are to share. And we hear the words that he offered to his disciples. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Now, during the past five Sundays, we've been gathering around this table um, to celebrate God's grace, God's love, God's joy, God's peace, and God's hospitality hospitality, a sense of being welcomed at the table, and hearing God's house, as we heard Tara say to the children, who's welcomed at the table? Everyone's welcomed at the table. And World Communion Sunday should be a reminder that geographical borders do not separate us in the body of Christ. We are united across those borders. And it's a reminder that as we hear the story of Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus wasn't concerned with borders. He crossed them as freely as he could, crossed borders and welcomed all whom he met, sat at the table with them and broke bread with them, reached out to those who were on the outside and those who were outcast, 
Remember him reaching out to the lepers who stood quite a few feet and yards away because they knew they had to keep separate from others. And Jesus welcomed them. He welcomed the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman at that. He met with Gentiles, non-Jewish believers, and broke bread with them. Jesus was often at odds with the religious leaders of his day who were more inclined to keep track of who should be in and who was definitely out than they were with spreading God's love to all. And Jesus kept pushing the envelope to bring people in. Jesus demonstrated for us the gift of radical hospitality, one that we continue to practice here this day at St. John's, a hospitality that is filled with a generous gift of grace and love and abundant joy for all. And yet sadly today, there are those who still don't feel welcomed at church for various reasons about their past, who they love, where they've come from, they feel that the church no longer welcomes them. People have been told, you don't belong here. People have been excluded for all sorts of reasons, denied a place at the table, and often by other believers in Christ. That's just not right. Around the world, it's not just the church that excludes people, but oftentimes it's a repressive government. And thus some have to come to the table in secret, knowing that much like the people that Paul would have written to at Philippi, that there was a fear in being visibly acknowledging that you were a Christian and gathering for the Lord's Supper. People that in Paul's time were fearful of persecution or being ostracized by family or society and detriment to their own business and well-being just for proclaiming Christ as Savior and celebrating communion. Over the past, I've been privileged to to travel. Um, And one of the places I've traveled to on numerous occasions was the nation of Haiti. I was on various mission trips previous to COVID. And since COVID and now with the political unrest in Haiti, um, it's, it's just unsafe to travel there, and my, my heart breaks for the individuals that we know there. Um, we have worked and visited, my wife and I have been to the Good Shepherd Orphanage um, in Port-au-Prince, and um, a, a wonderful place that just cares for children, um, and oftentimes has been subject to, to violence all around them, and it's just very difficult. But when I first went there after Hurricane Matthew, the destruction that we saw was enormous. And I was able to worship with a number of local churches at that time. One that I particularly remember was an early morning service, like 7.30 in the morning. And they worshiped at 7.30 because in Haiti in June, um, worshiping after 10 o'clock was just unbearably hot. So they worshiped at early morning. And they were worshiping under tarps because their building was unsafe to be in. And people, people walked on dirt roads for miles to get to worship there. Many of the women that we saw came in walking um, either in bare feet or sandals holding their dress shoes. And then when they reached to the tent, they put on their dress shoes so that they would have nicer shoes to wear um, because that was important. And given all that had happened, the spirit of worship in that tarp on that morning was powerful. The songs of joy, the prayers and the celebration of communion now, I barely understood much of what was being said because it was being offered in Creole, and that's, I don't speak Creole, I don't speak Spanish, there's a lot of things I don't speak. So I sat there just kind of nodding. I could tap my feet to the songs. But when it came to the celebration of communion, and one of the, the deacons offered me the bread and the cup, I knew what was going on. I knew the spirit that was there that day, and I knew that I was welcomed as a guest at that church that day as a guest at the table of our Lord. And I was honored to be a welcome guest. When today I hear about what's being said about Haitians in Springfield, Ohio, my heart breaks. In all of my trips to Haiti, I was always welcomed wherever we went. And let's be honest, as a six foot three white guy in the nation of Haiti, 
I stand out as an outsider pretty easily. It's not hard to recognize the white guy out in the, in the, where we're rowing. And yet that never mattered. I was never turned away. Hospitality was everywhere. On one of the trips I was at, we were able to take fruit trees that we had purchased um, through gift. There were fruit trees that came from the Dominican Republic brought over to Haiti. And we were taking them as a gift on behalf of a local church, making it real clear that it wasn't us Americans that were bringing this gift, but that it was a local pastor and his deacon that were bringing these fruit trees to people. And we would come to a house and we'd offer them, and, and we actually had shovels and we would plant the tree for them. And we, had it, we carried water so we could water it. At every single place we stopped, we were welcomed into people's homes. And when I say we were welcomed into people's homes, it's not like the homes that you and I live in. Um, rarely would they, did they have you know, indoor plumbing. Um, oftentimes you would come in and there would be kind of a little courtyard, um, maybe the size of you know, a quarter of the, the chancellery up here, um, and maybe a small overhang with some tarps on it or some plastic roofing. Um, and then there would be a, a living room that also at nighttime was a bedroom, and the kitchen was often an outdoor kitchen. And yet we were welcomed in as guests, and we were often offered something to drink and offered some fresh fruit. But most importantly, we were offered hospitality. We had an interpreter to help to share with us, but we really didn't need the interpreter because the spirit that was there at that time was so overwhelming and the joy that we received was far more than what we were giving of a simple fruit tree. I'm still in contact with some of our interpreters that we worked with down in Haiti um, through the, the magic of, of Facebook and Instagram and other things. They are truly wonderful, faithful people. Dedicated individuals faithful Christians in their journey with Christ. And for those who have come to the United States, they've come seeking a better life. The poverty and the violence in Haiti is just terrifying. And I can say that in all my trips there, no one was eating cats and dogs, I swear, no one. That wasn't an option. We did have goat meat sometimes, but you know we ate well. But to be treating people as poorly as we often do in this nation is just wrong. And it's all too common. Do know that on this Sunday in Springfield, Ohio, and throughout the United States, there are Haitians celebrating communion, just like you and I did it at a table just like this, sharing the bread of the body of Christ and the cup of the new covenant of forgiveness that Jesus offered to his disciples, sharing in their style and in their language, but sharing communion on this day. Here at St. John's, we celebrate communion twice a month, which for me in my 41 years is the first that I've celebrated communion twice a month. Um, when I was in seminary, the church that I was a student pastor at, um, they celebrated communion maybe three times a year. And the Sunday before was Preparatory Sunday, one of the most difficult Sundays to be a part of because it was so depressing because it was all about how sinful we are and how badly we needed God's grace and forgiveness. And it was, it was pretty heavy. Um, and then the next Sunday was communion, which was supposed to lift you up and you had to sign your little cards that you were there because you didn't want to miss communion when it was only offered three times a year. Uh, at that church in New Providence, Pennsylvania, Communion was something that was so special, you only did it a few times a year. And that was their tradition. In other churches I've been at, once a month was typical. But here at St. John's, it's twice a month. And that's wonderful, and we celebrate it. And yet, at times, we might take communion for granted. As another ritual that we just, oh, it's Communion Sunday, and okay, we'll do this. And yet, we go through the motions. And we don't think about it as being this special gift, this special celebration of being a welcome guest at the table of our Lord. It's too easy to let something that we do on a regular basis, kind of like the Lord's Prayer, become a ritual that we don't think about. 
This morning, I want to encourage you not to do that, but to mark each time we celebrate communion as something special. And I say that because I know that happens for me. But a month ago, something happened that reminded me of just how special and powerful communion is. In this interim time without a subtle pastor here at St. John's, a number of us are trying to take on um, the practices of what a pastor might do. And I volunteered to take home communion to some folks if they would like it. And one of those that I went to visit with Anna LeBrenz, who's at the Meta Lodge, which used to be called Pinra Manor. I visited Anna before, and so it was wonderful to go and visit her, although I had a reminder who I was because I've only been there twice, and you know, we, it's been maybe six months since I last saw her. Um, but she had wanted to have communion, and so I was happy to do that. Anna's been a member here since she was a little girl. And she can remember when worship at St. John's was in German. She was baptized here, confirmed, married here. Her whole life has revolved around this church. She remembers things about this church that most of us have probably never even heard of. And one, which I'll be writing about in November, there's a plaque in the narthex in memory of four men who died during World War II. I hadn't even known that plaque was there. And I've been here for two years, walked by it dozens of times. But Anna could not only remember the plaque, but the names of the four men that are on it. Powerful story and memory. But we'll save that for November. Anna let me know that they used to have worship there on a Sunday afternoon, but that the chaplain who was coming to do that had moved away. And they had not had worship there for over three months. And in fact, they're doing some renovation and for some reason the chapel's not even open right now. I thought that was extremely sad. And so Anna could not remember the last time she had communion. So I was honored to be able to do that. Now, again, we have to picture the scene. Anna's got a small, multi-purpose living room and then she's got a separate bedroom and her own bath. And we were sitting on her kind of love seat together with a TV tray between us. We didn't have any fancy decorations, no brass candlesticks, no silver communion set, um, no altar cloths. Um, we didn't have a cross. We didn't have any special music. The choir wasn't singing. Joel wasn't playing the organ. Um, I guess I could have recorded that and brought that in, maybe another time. But rather, it was Ann and I sitting side by side with a roll and a paper plate and two small paper cups with grape juice. Simple and plain. And as I thought of that, my mind went back, because my mind kind of does these kind of things where I flirt around, um, to the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade movie, um, where he's in search of the Holy Grail, and he comes to this big cavern room, and there's all these ornate chalices, um, and everybody thinks it's the one with the most diamonds and gems and jewels. And rather, it's this very simple, plain carpenter's cup that was the Holy Grail. Simple and plain. Because when we think about communion, that's part of it. But even though our paper cup and paper plate with our roll on it was simple and plain in Anna's room, the spirit was there. And it was powerful. It was a powerful moment, not because of anything I said, not because the role was something special, but rather it was the act of Anna's hospitality and the presence of the Holy Spirit that transformed that moment into something deeply spiritual. You could just feel it. I know I did, and I believe that Anna did as well. And again, while I came to offer the gift of communion, I came away receiving far more than I ever gave because that's the power of Holy Communion. It's not about what we're giving, it's about what we're receiving. And thanks be to God for that. Later that week, Pat Partridge let me know that she had spoken with Anna, and that Anna was very happy to have received Communion. And then she asked Pat the following question, how often can I receive Communion? How often can I receive communion? We receive it twice a month if we want it. 
Anna is at the mercy of someone bringing it to her. But it's so powerful and meaning to her that she would like it more often than once or twice a year. And that's the power of communion, the power of the body of Christ that unites us together. Anna doesn't take communion for granted, and neither should we. For her, it's special and powerful. And in response to her question, Pat and I will go and visit her this week, and we will bring her communion. Because that's what we do as people on a journey with Christ, as followers of Christ. Because that's what Paul tells us that we should do. It's what Paul offers to us when he writes to the Philippians and says, if you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, If his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Be energetic in your life of salvation. Be energetic in your life of discipleship. Show the joy that we know of being followers of Christ in all that we do. Extend the gift of hospitality to those whom you meet, to those who are lost, to those who are searching for meaning in life, to those who have felt left out and excluded. Share the joy of hospitality with them. Live a life that shows grace and peace and love and joy. There's enough hatred and division in our world. We all know that, but we're called to do something different. And here at St. John's, we are actively providing that, actively living it into life, the gift of hospitality, the gift of joy. Because living as a community of believers means a lot to us here. And so as followers of Jesus, we share the joy and the love that Christ has offered to each of us. I thank you for the privilege of sharing my stories this morning. I thank you for the privilege of being in ministry with you and I look forward to the journey that lies ahead for all of us. Thanks be to God, and amen.